Welcome to Do's and Donuts where we get to, ooh. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. You're welcome. Where Ryan has no idea what's going on and he, he gets to talk about do's and don'ts of the adaptive cultivator system. So Ryan is the manufacturer. He's visiting us from Ontario today. And uh, Ryan, you wanna go through a quick rundown of some do's and don'ts for the adaptive cultivator system? Yep. Um, so we thought we'd talk about some of the adjustment uh, do's and don'ts on the, tra on the ACS. And I'll start here at the front and sort of work myself towards the back. Um, on the front, we have the adaptive um, frame or the spider system on here. These are really good at crumbling soil. Um, and really the only adjustments we have here is the ability to kind of rotate it back and forth this way. So for most typical installations, we're going to tip it in towards the row, which is over on this side. It's going to move a little bit of soil in towards the road, do a little bit of hilling. Um, but if you don't want a hilling action, um, we set the fingers to kind of disperse the soil from there. If you're mounting this on smaller tractors that don't have a lot of weight, especially on the rear, typically we will always mount the spider tipped away from the row. We will just do some soil removal from the row, but more importantly what it does is it encourages the spider to kind of walk the toolbar towards the row, while the larger fingers push the toolbar away from the row, and it creates a balance so you're not driving the tractor sort of sideways Those light, down the field. Those lighter tractors that Yeah, don't lighter have the, tractors in the 1500 to 2000 pound class tend to run sideways if you're running both things off to the same so way. There's just too much side. don't run that way with the light tractor with most the light likely because it's going to push you It's just going to push you okay. over, flip it the other way. Over in the finger weeder side, and I should mention while I'm here, that you might have seen in the video the spiders catching the fingers. If when you're setting the machine up and it's hanging in the air like it is now and they are touching, it's not something to worry about. As you're engaged in the soil and things flatten out, the fingers will move away from the spiders. You shouldn't have any interference in the field. So for the fingers themselves, in terms of adjustments, in most of the circumstances, what we're going to do is we're going to tip the head. You can see it can rotate side to side this way, tipped all the way down, or that way tipped all the way away. For most of the time, we're going to leave it tipped just slightly in. There's drive spikes that are on the bottom of the fingers, and we want just the side closest to the row to be contacting the soil. If the fingers are tipped too much, you're not going to engage the drive spikes, which help the fingers spin faster than you're moving. And so then you're just riding on the fingertips, which will do, you know, a decent amount of weed control, but it's better if you're on the spikes. If you're too flat, both sides of the drive spikes will drag and create a stall and the finger weeder won't spin any longer. For folks that have fairly flat fields um, or, or either a dish or flat across where the trees or vines are. You'll tip it a little bit in like this. If you have a bit of a berm, you may tip it back a little bit to help those drive spikes catch the edge of the bed. The other adjustment on the head is right here, and it's a forward and backwards tilt. So typically when we're shipping these, they come, this part comes assembled. There's five holes in here, and we typically always have it on the fourth hole if we're counting from the back. Creates a slight amount of tail drag on the unit. So earlier, when I talked about the spiders throwing a little bit of soil into the row, if we create a little bit of tail drag on the unit, it means most of the pressure's on the rear fingers. So they tend to bite in and disperse any soil that was pushed into a hill as opposed to if we tip it forward, like this, we'll just put that in there to hold it. Most of the pressure is now on the front fingers, and so they tend to push into the soil and kind of push it up into even more of a hill around the vine. So we always want to take a little bit of a back drag. You may even have an existing column lift that's sort of slowly rotated like this over time due to force from a grape pole radius. And some of this adjustment will help you take that into account. So where do um, I, if, if I've got a small tractor, yep. and I've got it turned, the spider's turned, so it's helping keep me towards the row, and yep. I'm pulling soil kind of away, 
Would I want to have it more on the front side to push soil back into the row? No, it, 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 the spiders typically won't move that much soil okay. away. Um, I encourage people to not run them at the full angle, maybe run them a little bit straighter. Okay, um, so don't kick it the whole way over. Just Yeah, you know, just, just run them on the little you. bit. The spiders will work even straight on these steel spiders. The other reason that I don't typically run this in the forward position like this and more in the back position is there's often like rocks or sticks or other obstacles in your vineyard or orchard. And with the head tip back with the fingers towards the front of the machine a little bit higher, it tends to help it climb obstacles. When it's in the forward position and down, especially if you have a little bit of hilling a little bit of a berm, it tends to walk into the berm and walk itself down the hill as opposed to biting in near the top where it's supposed to work. And then as long as you have, so when I'm setting this up, I usually try to aim the center of this when it's in its resting state at about the edge of the guard here and the head will flex away. And then typically what I teach operators is don't hit your vines or your trees with the guard and the rest of the system, for the most part, will take care of itself. Um, get comfortable with it at a lower speed, but know that it will excel at a faster speed. You know, typically I like to run these in the six to nine kilometer an hour range. Sort of that's probably in the four to seven mile an hour range. It's a nice comfortable speed. Um, if you have soft bark trees, such as peaches, things like that. You'd want to avoid using the harder yellow fingers. You might get some bark damage, especially below the soil where you can't see it. We do have some softer fingers that we're, uh, that we're working on that'll work better for that. Okay, and, so don't uh, use these yellow ones for on soft bark the softer stuff. bark yeah, stuff. Yeah, these work great on uh, hardier trees like apples, um, grapes, those kind of things. But nursery tree stock, peaches, um, typically work better with the softer fingers. Just, you know, what about little, early small stage vines or something like that? Yeah, so small stage vines, if you have a young planting, um, really often we don't adjust the setup. I just encourage operators to move further away from the row and that'll reduce the pressure on the tip of the fingers there. So instead of you know running the vines either almost touching or a couple inches away from this, we might be in the six to eight inch range. And uh, if you got a field with a lot of interplantings, you kind of have to make a, a decision. Am I going to run my whole field a little bit further away? Or am I going to pay attention and uh, you know, move away? If you're doing dual units and all that, if your young vines are staked, you usually don't have a problem. Because um, the fingers aren't always touching the actual vine. They're kind of working around it. It's just the pressure from the fingers can jostle that stuff around. Um, another area that uh, might be a struggle is if you're looking out at your field and you already have a lot of established weeds. You know, things have gotten away from you for a few years. You're trying to be organic, but you don't have a good method of control. And you got weeds that are two, three feet tall with long tap roots. We're not going to see a lot of success in the field with that. Um, this is a maintenance tool, not a repair tool. And uh, it does a great job once you get weeds under control. If the weeds have been fast growing and haven't formed fiber in the stems yet, you know, early mm -hmm. spring, it'll deal with slightly taller weeds. But, you know, you've got a long dry summer. It's been a couple months with no rain. You might only see a 12 inch tall weed, but it's got a strong taproot and the system is just going to struggle with that. Um, if we made it strong enough to remove those weeds, we'd see a lot more damage in, in the crop we're trying to keep. Good. So don't, yeah, don't view it as a recovery tool per se but yeah. i will say one thing that we found when we used it um in, in a vineyard that did have quite a bit of of extra growth was you know yeah we just had to run it multiple yep. times and so have that expectation don't expect it to do it overnight you know one pass but but when we hit it twice and then we came back a week later after it baked in the sun and hit it two more times we we're able to start catching up a little bit better and what some guys will do is pull the finger section off these five bolts that hold this on and run just the spiders to help mm. loosen up the soil right alongside the vines. Always what you're looking for with finger weeders is under the soil surface is to create a profile with a shelf so that the fingers have something to bite into and to bust. And so in that case, you know, you run over with a couple times with the spiders, really loosen it up, get it crumbly. Your next pass, you can get the fingers to punch in through that crust and hopefully start breaking that up. Um, 
in situations where you have a carpet, especially if grass is on top, um, you can actually start to cause some damage to the crop if you're trying to get into a full carpet because the fingers will try to ride on right on top of that and then they will hit the, I've seen this in apples before, um, they'll hit the tree with the fingers as opposed to being in the soil and moving from soil pressure. And so that's just a situation where you'd want to at least loosen the soil either with a shallow rototilling or a lot of passes from this before you try to go into sod. Um, it, you're going to see some some damage there. So don't be running the fingers on top. I mean, um, that goes with our other finger readers too, but I think that's really key with this because when we ran it, I would agree, if we probably would have ran it without this, I mean, really what we were doing was we were creating that shelf. So yep. the next a week later, stuff was drying out, but it really, we were able to hit it again and, and push through that below the surface there with the fingers. Yeah, and if you're doing multiple passes, you can do them a little quicker and, you know, with a little more ease if you're running just the spiders on the front and running back and forth across. So it's a nice way to, you know, get in a few extra passes a little quicker. And that's also probably another reason to not have it pitched this way much because while it can roll over something's yeah. nicer, it also can roll and ride on top of the soil, which hits at above the, the yes. root level. And so we're running it at right? about a five degree tail drag. In heavy, you're right, in heavy weed conditions, you might tip it to the center or a five degree forward so that it does push away from the, the crop as opposed yeah. to trying to drive itself in, which is what we're normally trying to do to get it to punch in. But in those excessive weed situations, you want as least resistance as you can get. Well, good. I, I think that was helpful for me to, I mean, I've operated it, but it's good to kind of get, I like hearing the, you know, keep your vine here, you know, how, how you get some of the alignment stuff. Uh, if you have any questions on things like that, obviously give us a call um, and uh, we'd ha be happy to help you out. Um, but hopefully this has been a good video for you. We do uh, have the final part of this, of what we do that Ryan had no idea what we were doing, but uh, today, do's and donuts is what the series is called. So yeah. you caught that at the beginning, but uh, that came out of just, I saw do's and don'ts that he had written out as donuts for some reason, and I was confused for a second, and then it ran into a, a series. So, you get to eat a donut at the end of the series, and you get to give it a ranking from 1 to 10. Now, we didn't have any Tim Hortons around here. <laughs> we only had what we call ACDC donuts, Amish country donuts here, and... Uh, we also were going to go for the bacon ones, but they didn't have any Canadian bacon to go oh. on top. So uh, you Look can at that. Uh, that is a go big for donut. Wow. The donut there. <laughs> and last time I said I'd get uh, uh, napkins, and I did, but they're sitting back there. So you know what? We're just going to go for it again. And uh, these are huge. That is a good donut. Oh, thanks, Brent. We aren't, we aren't complete animals, but... What are we ranking this out of? All right, one to 10, that's all, all you get. So yesterday, the video I did, our first introduction video, I had a Bavarian cream donut, but we got a delicious glazed donut today. So for, for what, maybe from a glazed donut ranking, what would you say? I'm gonna give it a solid eight, eight and a half. We got a donut place in St. Catharines downtown, Beechwood. I'll tell you if he's top notch, but this is. So next time when, when we go to, when I go visit Ryan, we're going to do one there and you're going to bring that. I'm going to go with some other donuts. And we're going to, we're going to have I a like ranking it. on that and see how that goes. This but, is an excellent donut. Oh, my rating. Oh, Ryan gave his. I didn't get my rating. Oh, okay. You know what? As, as these are fresh, as glazed donuts go, man, I, I probably would give it an eight to nine as well. Somewhere in there. That That's. I'm not quite sure what would be better, but man, that's a good donut. So yeah. D donut side cheers. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. Uh, Thank you. Any questions, throw them in the comments. Uh, let us know. Also, again, any specific things you would like us to go over. Uh, hopefully it's helpful for you. We'd like to do some more as well. So thanks for watching. Take care. Once again, I actually forgot to say where Amish Country Donuts are from. They are from Sugar Creek, Ohio here. And, and we got a cool wrench. And you've already talked long enough, but thanks for watching.